What's up, Beefcakes? It's the Beefcake Supreme Force in the building. And basically, I just saw Killers of the Flower Moon. You don't remember this, but in 2021, I made a video called Top 10 Most Anticipated Films of 2022, and I put Killers of the Flower Moon at number one. So I've been waiting a long time, like many people, for this film. I finally saw it. Scorsese is my favorite director. Robert De Niro is my favorite actor. Everyone loves Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm speechless. Kills of the Flower Moon takes place in 1920s Oklahoma, and it looks at the Osage Nation, and basically that they had a lot of oil land, and Robert De Niro's character, William Hale, is very well loved among the Osage Nation, but he's actually committing genocide and is killing them and stealing their land. His nephew, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, Ernest Burkhardt, marries Molly, played by Lily Gladstone, who is of inheritance of oil land. And through basically intermarriage with white people and Native Americans, through inheritance, they can steal land by killing their family. This movie's fucked up. The reason for the delay of this film was because originally this movie was going to be a much more faithful adaptation of the book that it's based on, Killers of the Flower Moon. Originally in this book, it was more of a police procedural or an FBI procedural, and it focused on Tom White, played by Jesse Plemons in the film. If they had gone about it that way, it would have been kind of lame because it would have just been a white savior movie or an FBI savior movie. But thankfully, they shifted the perspective instead of the FBI to Molly, and her husband, specifically Ernest Burkhardt, and it kind of just explores the relationship. How can you marry somebody but then kill their family? That's just insane. It explores racism, explores the thin line between love and hate, that it's not completely on opposite ends of the spectrum, but they're really right next to each other. It explores how uh, racism within a relationship, it explores greed, and ambition in the same way of Wolf of Wall Street. The two movies I thought about a lot as I was watching the film was The Wolf of Wall Street and The Irishman. The Wolf of Wall Street because of a tale about greed and ambition, but The Irishman because it wasn't carried with the sensationalism of Wolf of Wall Street or Goodfellas or Casino, but more the bleakness and inevitability of The Irishman. The movie leaves you absolutely breathless. I mean, I was exasperated when I saw the film. And one of the easiest things that you can detect and uh, verbally communicate with people was how great the performances were. Leonardo DiCaprio, he's great in everything, but this is legitimately a contender for his best performance. The Wolf of Wall Street and The Aviator are still like very tippy top for me, but his performance here is absolutely incredible. And it's actually kind of the opposite side of the same coin with Jordan Belford from The Wolf of Wall Street, because on one hand, he has the same amount of greed and ambition and as well as this like stupidity and foolishness and demonicness to um, Jordan Belfort. But he's not cool. He's not funny. He's not entertaining. His performance here, I mean, nobody on this planet would want to be Ernest Burkhardt, unlike Jordan Belfort, where there may be people who would like to be him or live his life. And what's crazy about this movie is just the reason they're greedy, because Ernest Burkhardt technically makes money by committing mass murder, but his life isn't better because of it. And you also look at Robert De Niro's character, play, uh, character's name, William King Hale. He's old as hell. Why do you want more money? What the fuck are you gonna do with it, motherfucker? I think it's an absolutely astounding performance. And I think it's the first time I ever saw Leonardo DiCaprio play a guy who legitimately looks like a middle-aged man, not like a well-groomed sort of person. He looks like a mess. Robert De Niro, for anyone worried, he still got it. And we had a lot of fun hyping up Ryan Gosling, saying, oh, he needs a, he needs an Oscar. No. Let's be serious now. Give it to the GOAT. Give it to the man who probably, let's face it, invented acting. It, this is, he's incredible. He's absolutely incredible. But I can't talk about the performances without talking about Lily Gladstone. The only thing I had seen her in was Certain Women, directed by Kelly Reichardt, and I thought she was really great. She was the most memorable part of that movie, I think. And in here, wow, she's incredible. To play a character like that, where so many horrible things are happening to you, not just directly, but just 
seeing your family get murdered, to see your community disintegrate. I mean, that's just such a devastating kind of situation. How do you play someone with so much misery? How does it not become, I don't know, flat? How does it not become numbing after a while playing a character like that? But you really sense that pain and you see it in her eyes, just the amount of trauma that she carries. But I also like that her performance is not totally defined by that. She's very funny. Uh, she's very charming. Uh, has a real sense of humor. I love the way Lily Gladstone kind of carries herself and uh, absolutely is a great scene partner uh, with DiCaprio. I think when I see those two together, they, they seem perfect. They're totally equals, by the way. Thelma Schoonmaker is the direct, the editor of many of Scorsese's, of almost all of Scorsese's films, and she really only edits his films. But the editing in this film is really interesting. I think that there are really interesting choices of like fade-ins and fade-outs. There are moments of non-literal stuff happening. I can't say that I fully loved the movie. The first, the first 20 minutes, I want to say, had me a little worried because there were, especially, and I hate to say this because Robbie Robertson, the composer of this film, recently passed away, but I wasn't fully behind with the soundtrack of this movie. I thought it was a little corny and, you know, Scorsese typically uses songs to when he wants to use music and whenever he does have a composer, he uses Robbie Robertson, who I think generally gets the job done. I didn't, f I, the soundtrack was a little lame at first, but it definitely got better. There are also instances of digital cinematography that looked a little awkward and I didn't fully love it. Spoiler alert, I will be talking about the ending right now, um, so definitely see it if you can. I was thinking about The Wolf of Wall Street and The Irishman, as I said, when I was watching this movie, but when I saw the ending, which was basically a retelling of the entire movie through a radio show in the early 60s, I kind of reduced the story, reduced even the history of the Osage Nation. It's an interesting kind of meta-commentary on the limitations of the film itself, and the more I think about it, the better it gets, but it reminded me of the assassination of Jesse James which it reminded me of subconsciously as I was watching the film, because it also talks about the objectification, as you might say, of history. Because in that film, you see Robert Ford assassinate Jesse James, and then you see Robert Ford redoing the assassination on stage. And it's kind of a funny, redundant version of the movie that we saw or the scene that we saw because it doesn't fully accurately tell the story of what we saw in the movie but anyways it kind of reminded me of that and i definitely like the assassination of jesse james more it also reminded me of malcolm x because clearly scorsese didn't want to leave this on a sour note on a note of just the osage nation experienced an atrocity the end it ends with a shot of the Osage Nation. They're playing music. They are celebrating their culture. And it's a really beautiful note because it doesn't just end fully cynically. The Osage Nation goes on and they will remember this history and they're not gone. It reminded me kind of of Malcolm X because in that film, I'm gonna spoil the ending of that, I guess. It ends with the assassination of Malcolm X, but then it also ends with the eulogy of Malcolm X and it's a very beautiful note because it addresses yes he was assassinated but his ideas still go on his legacy goes on I just think Malcolm X did it better and I feel like the f I don't know maybe the ending could have been a little different the more I think about it the better it gets but I can't say that I absolutely loved it when I saw it this movie's worth the wait this movie's worth the runtime you got to see the movie if you haven't seen the movie you hate film. You just hate film. Like, but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.